Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to VIMS and the Virginia Coastal Policy Center's presentation of Coastal Resilience Tools for Local Governments. Um, we are hope very excited about this opportunity. We're hoping to get some real hands-on um, interaction going today. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Gray Montrose. I am the Assistant Director of the Virginia Coastal Policy Center, and I am your MC today. Um, we are going to get started with our first presentation here in just a few minutes, but I want to introduce our speakers. We are going to be talking about a couple of different tools today, and we have some fabulous presenters who are going to be uh, walking us through those. Of course, Elizabeth Andrews, our director here at the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. We have one of our summer policy fellows, Sarah Henshaw, who is going to be zooming in from North Carolina. She is a student at UNC Chapel Hill. We also have Pam Mason of VIMS and then myself. Um, so again, thank you everyone for being here. So I'll start by introducing our first speaker, Pam Mason. She is a senior scientist at the Virginia Institute for Marine Science. She has a degree in biology from the University of Delaware, go Blue Hens, and then a degree from William and Mary in marine science. Um, during her time at VIMS, Pam has made tremendous contributions as a member of the Center for Coastal Resource Management. Um, she has worked to develop two websites, in particular, adaptva.org, which we're gonna be working with a lot today. And the idea is to, to target audiences who seek to adapt to climate change along the coast. And we're gathering information and putting it together in an accessible way. And that's really our goal today is that we're gonna be looking at these tools, looking at things that sometimes can be a little bit intimidating and figuring out ways to use them in a way um, that is accessible for our local governments in particular, and really anyone who is interested in resilience. So Pam, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Gray. Um, can I get a, everyone can hear me thumbs up or chat? All right, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead then and um, start my presentation. So let me share my screen. Hold on a second. Okay, let me share first. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Can. Yep. To go back to my first slide. Sorry, oh, I started at the middle. My apologies. So again, um, I'm Pam Mason, and I'm going to be talking today about largely about the Adapt Virginia website and some of the tools and information on that website. This is um, the Adapt VA website is actually a um, well. Okay. So first, so why does it matter? And Notably in our area, there's concern over sea level rise, coastal flooding and storm surge. And actually those three terms specifically ended up in a um, piece of legislation recently about the Virginia um, Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act um, new regulation. And so that's why I started with those three terms, but these issues are global and specifically a local problem. It is happening all over the United States, coastal US, except for a few areas where sea level is actually lowering um, in Alaska, for instance. So what can we do with this information? How can we find out what's going on in our area? What's happening down my street? Um, maybe what kind of options are available to address some of these problems? And notably, all within the context of within Virginia, Virginia has um, established policy in, in various places to um, support nature-based solutions to address some of these issues. So how can I learn more? And so um, that information and is available in Adapt VA. So I'm gonna walk through some of that. So a real brief overview. So um, Adapt VA has five tabs of information and I'm going to be walking through those. So there's a tab that deals with water levels, one that deals with adaptations. Then we have um, a Resilience resources, this is a new information tab on the um, website. And then we have a planning and policy tab. And then I'm gonna spend a, a bit of time on information about something that we generically refer to as the NNBF project. 
And um, I will go into detail about that. And that's where we'll be spending much of our time working on the interactive viewer and looking at the natural nature-based features data and information on living shorelines. And hopefully then after I do that long overview, we will have an opportunity for folks maybe to put information in the chat or ask a question about where they live or maybe a question about how some of the data might be displayed to answer their questions. So this is the, the front entering page of ADAPTBA. I would note for you all that um, we actually have two, our, two URLs and I'm not sure if I put my pointer if you can see it. So, but adaptba.org or adaptba.com. So, and this is this is the entry page. I would also note that the adaptba is a collaborative effort. Initially, we started it with funding that was a private grant funding, and um, we partnered with the VCPC um, with um, so the. Other folks at William Mary, notably Sarah Stafford, um, an economist at William Mary, and also Wetlands Watch, and then Department of Conservation and Recreation and CCRFR, the Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding. So the first bucket, as I said, is the um, forecasts, which comes comes down to information about water level. So if you access this first tab, you'll you'll note that there's three different options here. Um, and I'm just highlighting a, a few. So for the water levels, the one that is of great interest often to folks is what actually are the projections for water levels and the observed data. So I would point out that the first graph, you can access this graph and what it shows you is several different things. So first of all, we have data that's being uh, produced at here at VIMS and it's based on historic observed. So this dark blue line, the solid line is actual observed data. So those are real measurements of water levels. The orange, pale orange down here is the projection of that curve without any change in rate. So that would be what that curve looks like projected out to 2050. And then the error around that curve are the orange dots. Also displayed that you can access is all of NOAA's projections. So there's six. Um, most notably, you might be interested in the NOAA Intermediate High, which has been chosen to be the level that has been incorporated in the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act forecasting um, information for on their new regulations. It's also the level that's been chosen for protection for state buildings and by the Virginia Department of Transportation. So. The intermediate high is this level right here. You also, we have, I have turned on for this particular slide example, the, the elevations that were associated with Hurricane Isabel and with Tropical Storm Irene. What I don't have on here, but you can turn on is the US Army Corps of Engineers curves. Right now, statistically, it appears that from, based on most of this information that these curves tend to be on the low side of all of these other projections. The other information that is, is super rel relevant um, that I don't have an example of is Tidewatch, and that's a 36 hour observation. And that's a mapper where you can sort of see based on um, observations that are being taken offshore and then projections for 36 hours where water levels might be relative to any particular time of the day um, within the time frame of the 36 hours. So for instance, if a storm is approaching Virginia, and it's estimated to be a day, a day and a half away. If you go to the Tidewatch mapper, you can see what those water levels are projected to look like in our area. And then the other one is the sea level um, report cards. These are produced for all of the locations and the stations shown in the map in the bottom of the slide. And what the report card does is it takes something and it produces a graph that's not unlike a simplified version of this one, the Sewell's Point graph but it does it for um, 32 different coastal localities al along the United States coast. I would note that the sea level report cards are produced annually. So the data, as I was saying, that this observed data and the projections based on the observed data is updated on an annual basis with the preceding 12 months of data over the, the, uh, over the data record. So sea level report cards are updated in January and new, new data is posted. It's not that you would necessarily note, but if you had saved a, a, a graph from the year before, you might see that it shows a new year. For instance, these are um, downloaded from 2020. So actually um, 
if I went in and put the new one in, it would now probably be up to 2021. So the next um, bucket in ADAPT VA is the adapt adaptation stories. And these are story maps that tell, um, provide information on different adaptation approaches that have been taken relative to um, shorelines, infrastructure, planning, and funding. And so the way this, this basically works is you can see that there's um, different pieces of information. So our shorelines, we've separated into sort of living shorelines, shoreline green enhancements. So this is where it's a term used for where hardened structures are used, but they are, um, they are created and designed and implemented in a way that adds some green element, whether it's windows or breaks or steps to allow for some sort of um, biological or ecological activity. Then we focus um, next on different information about buildings. So how you can build, where you can build, transportation, and then we have zoning and planning. And then finally, financial incentive story map. And the way that, that those work is, um, and I've just highlighted three here in this. So this first one shows green enhancements. And basically what it says is if you have an engineered structure such as a revetment, bulkhead, or seawall that's required because of the circumstances of, of lack of space, navigation, commercial interests, that there may be opportunities to add some green elements. And so it goes through the stories and, and tells you how that might work. The second example um, I have here is um, managed retreat. And it talks about um, processes like buyouts and, and things like that. And then the last one is um, zoning and building codes. And we talk about things like cr cluster zoning and free board requirements. So if you, as you go through those story maps, you can get more information about how all those adaptation processes might work. So now moving on to the resilience resources bucket, which is our, our fifth, our, well, I've talked about these two. I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna come back to tools at the end. So I've covered these two and now I'm on resilience resources. And again, we have um, three different buckets of information one that focuses mostly on community resources, maps and websites, and then social and justice information. So I'm gonna highlight first the community resources. There's several things that um, are, provide great information in this first bucket. So the first one is the Marissa Climate Data Portal, and this is um, the Mid-Atlantic Coastal RISA. And, um, it, when you access this link, it takes you to this website, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, we have a natural resource climate change. I didn't highlight this time, but that's a, a database that talks about natural resources and the anticipated shifts in, in different populations, and that's data that was collected by um, the Center for Coastal Resources Management. We have Shoreline Restoration for Resilience, this points to a web page at the Center for Coastal Resources Management underneath something that we affectionately call the Shoreline Management Handbook. And it basically talks about activities that would occur along the shoreline that are restoration based, that may or may not provide other co-benefits, um, but wherein one of the primary drivers is actually the restoration rather than necessarily specifically erosion control or water quality um, services, but, but really more from a habitat perspective, but how they link together. And then the bottom um, bucket is right now serving um, a, a table that's been um, developed by Wetlands Watch. And it's we're calling it the Resiliency Database. And eventually this database will also have information about projects themselves. But at this time, the information that's fairly um, been vetted and reviewed is in the two buckets of planning and studies and funding resources. And so if you click on this, you will land at this table and you will be able to go through and look at different um, plans. And then there's information about funding. Um, and I would note that uh, this data um, table is still in process, as I said, to actually end up adding information about project specific data as well. So when that information is completed, we will, we will link it here and it will be available for everyone to use and access. So going back real quickly to the Mid-Atlantic uh, RISA, the climate data portal and the mapper that you saw, 
So it turns out that these screen captures aren't, aren't great and I apologize for that. Um, so the, the Mid-Atlantic RISA has developed these um, community climate outlooks and they're two pagers. And for each locality in Virginia, and you could see from the website I had just shown. So from this website, you're able to click on your different um, coastal locality and it will bring up this, a two pager. And so it's, it's organized in a way that it gives information about sea level rise. And so again, that graph um, along with the, the projected um, potential range around the, the planning horizon, it get, provides information about flooding, um, agriculture impacts of flooding and potential um, sea level rise and tidal intrusion on um, agricultural um, activities in that locality. And then it has a bucket on temperature and a bucket on precipitation. And the temperature one speaks a little bit to um, impacts on things like human health and or resources. So where we expect that temperature shifts in water temperature, well, air temperature, which drives shifts in water temperature, for instance, may lead to a change in fisheries productivity. And so that kind of information would be available here. And then information on precipitation, the general thinking is that there will be you know, what we call winners and losers in the precipitation game. Um, you know, the expectation is that our weather will continue to get stormier and, and current trends show that that has been the case, that the weather's gotten stormier. And so there might be bigger periods of high intensity rainfall followed by longer gaps of no rainfall. So um, a larger shift from wet to dry and drought conditions. And so that information is shown uh, here along with potential future scenarios for each locality. So the third bucket on that page um, has some social vulnerability information. And the first social vulnerability viewer is actually on ADAPT VA, but these two are services that link out to um, other tools. So the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Justice and Equity Dashboard, which I would note is in beta, but is a great resource. It opens up um, a map. You can drill down and find information about DEIJ, um, about a community at community level. And then the other one that is linked here is the EPA Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool. And I just happened to highlight um, part of, of Maryland in this, in this window, just so you can get a sense of what it does. So if you, you can pick a geography, you can pick a site, you can draw a line, or you can type in an address, or you can click on a map to get a census block. So there's very different ways to use this. And then the bottom line is you can access the census information and get data and data reports. So the last bucket before I turn to the tools is planning and policy. And this bucket focuses right now on two major um, ideas or information areas. So the community rating system, um, which is the voluntary program under the National Flood Insurance Program. And um, if you're not aware, it basically works like uh, analogous in my mind anyway, to a lead certification where different things that, that a locality might implement, be they processes, programs, or make tools available that they can use those um, implemented processes to get points and they can gather those points together. And so many points puts them in a rating level and each rating level corresponds to a reduction in the cost of flood insurance for the constituents that live in their locality. So it's basically a way to make flood insurance more affordable. Um, and I'll, I will show what that slide looks like or that website section looks like. And then the other one is legal authorities and analyses. And this is where we have some search engines for local ordinances and state legislation provisions. I will point out that this particular one does need updating at this point. We've had a lot of activity um, in state legislation and provisions around adaptation and, and climate space as of late. And so this um, particular search table does need an um, addressing and then we have a link to VCPC reports and we're going to update this and provide some additional links um, after this webinar. So this is the click through on the CRS and you can see it will take you to information from um, Wetlands Watch and the studies that they've done and also will link you to the Coastal Virginia CRS work group. 
Um, this most of this information activity is led by Mary Carson Stiff and Skip Skyle at Wetlands Watch. So if you have um, additional questions about that that I'm not able to answer, um, feel free to contact them about this information. Um, most of this is pulled together by them and we work together to serve it on the website. And then for the BCPC, I have put Elizabeth down for this. This I've done two screen captures. I would point out that their reports and collaborative documents list is really long because they've done a lot of work. Um, and it's divided by some of these like subheading categories. So state and local governments, sea level rise or current flooding, water quality. And, and the, I would have to have another whole line to, to capture all the reports that they have. Um, this is a, a great um, spot to find information about um, some of the different issues around um, policy and, and considerations for options to um, address some of those issues. And I also did a real quick screen capture of their conferences and events. This is apparently um, a place to look for um, web links or links to previous webinars. So this is the section on the website, which we will probably be adding a direct link to this to Adapt VA to make that easier for folks to find. Um, so I thought I would pause there for a second and see if anybody has any questions about those other four buckets before I dive more into natural nature-based features. So thank you, Pam. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A right now, but if anyone has any, please feel free to post them now. And also to echo Stacy and Denise, um, if folks want to introduce themselves in the chat with your name, your affiliation, um, that would be fantastic because we do want to have a group conversation. So if everybody wants to introduce themselves and say, hi, I'm here, please feel free to do that. Thanks. Thanks, ladies. Um, okay, so now I'm going to dive down into um, natural nature based features. So what do we do with too much water? Um, so the, the focus today for part of my conversation is getting to sharing information about what we affectionately call the NNBF project. So nature based solutions or natural nature based features and those two terms are basically synonymous, I think. For a long time, we used natural nature-based features, but nature-based solutions is one less word, so it's becoming more popular. But basically, we're talking marshes, beaches, dunes, riparian buffers. Um, these features provide erosion protection. They can provide flood benefits. They provide habitat, and they can be a, a long-term sustainable solution because, as natural features, they are um, well. They are very resilient to natural conditions. So. Um, Living shorelines is one of those um, ways that we can do that as a nature-based solution that's man-made. So the original term natural nature-based solutions came because what they were trying to do with that term is, is sort of differentiate between things that are already on the ground that, that are natural systems now and things that humans can implement that mimic natural systems. So, so that's why you get natural and then nature-based. Um, so the idea is that nature-based are things that, that humans can create to mimic those natural services. Um, so in this case, you know, one of the ones that's very commonly used in, in our area along our tidal shores are living shorelines, which use marsh, beach, and dunes to protect the upland areas and may or may not be paired with a structure. And then the other piece of this is conservation landscaping or basically repairing buffer landscaping, however you might want to do it. I'm using this sort of more global term and basically uses vegetation to slow rainwater and reduce pollution and address wet soils. So that's sort of the stuff behind, you know, that might be above tidal inundation, but may or may not be subjected to storm surge. And so that's something important to think about. So in our natural nature-based features project um, that was a three-year project we extended for a year. We're finishing it now. Um, the, there's a team of folks, many of the same folks that work on ADAPT VA. So this was a collaborative effort between CCRM VIMS, BCPC, um, Wetlands Watch, and the Albemarle Pamlico Estuarine Program. And we wanted to basically look at ways to um, prioritize and encourage the use of natural nature-based features to enhance coastal flooding resistance 
uh, or sorry, resilience, not resistance, my apologies. And to do that, first, we had to find out where all the natural nature-based features were. And we had to decide what our study area was going to be. And so we chose an area of less than 10 feet of elevation in the coastal zone. Then we, need, we developed a ranking. So we identified and ranked those natural base features. And then we decided to work on a, a way to identify targets for new natural nature base features. So what that looks like really briefly, and I'm, I'll show a lot more detail about this, but this is an example of what the study area looks like in Virginia. Everything highlighted in yellow um, is a, a building that is below a land surface elevation of 10 feet in elevation. We focused on the 10 feet of elevation basically for, because looking at storm surge levels, for instance, from Hurricane Isabel, since Isabel arrived at mean high water and then had a storm surge of eight to 10, depending on where you were, basically 10 feet of elevation was an, was an area that was susceptible, potentially susceptible to storm surge from, from a hurricane like Hurricane Isabel. The other thing is under 10 feet elevation often indicates the areas that are most likely by the year 2100 to be potentially also either flooded or then um, underwater during spring or, or, you know, sort of our annual high tide situations or king or storm tide situations. We identified through this process over 170,000 primary buildings at less than 10 feet elevation. We use the term primary building because we have a building footprints and we removed anything less than about 900 square feet at, as an effort to try to eliminate um, freestanding garages and small and lot really large sheds so that we were focusing on things that truly were likely to be houses or commercial structures or hospitals, you know, in other words, true buildings. Then um, these are the natural nature based features that we focused on in this study. And here's just an example of, of a close up of Virginia Beach. In coastal Virginia, there were over 350,000 units, polygons mapped as natural nature based features. You can see our list um, includes beaches, dunes, three versions of living shorelines. This data specifically comes from a database that CCRM keeps um, and categorizes and provides information. We, we, we keep a lot of information specific to living shorelines. It's um, a big um, focus of much of our research at CCRM. And so this is a, a, a database that we um, keep as much detail and precision on as we can. There's two upland types, wooded and scrub shrub, and this basically has to do with the height of the vegetation. These are both woody vegetated um, habitats, but wooded basically is trees and scrub shrub is things that are could, could be trees, but might be cut over or might just actually be scrubby areas. Then there's um, three kinds of non-tidal wetlands, so forested, scrub shrub, and emergent, and then tidal marsh. So then we um, took the NNBFs and wanted to develop a ranking. The reason for developing the ranking was to give information to the local governments about which NNBFs in their areas might be providing the most services. And the way we developed the ranking was, the first thing we did was natural nature-based features flooding mitigation services, which is this total capacity. And so what we looked at was two things, the inherent ability, the in situ, um, vegetative structure of that feature to actually provide um, flood benefit capacity. So in other words, would it, uh, was it a vegetative feature? So it would slow flood waters um, and did it have surface roughness? There were several different attributes that we considered in that. And the second part, so that's, that's um, capacity. The second part is opportunity. Opportunity is where does that feature sit in the title frame? So the features that are closest or lowest in the tidal frame are more frequently going to be intercepting floodwaters because they're the first features that get flooded. And so they will have the opportunity more frequently to provide that service. So we developed a statistical distribution and we just divided it into three percentiles to say low, medium, and high to reflect that capacity um, question. Then the next thing are these next two features are related to our coastal buildings. And the first one is the number of buildings that a natural nature-based features benefits. So if the, if the natural nature-based feature is waterward essentially of that building and the flow from that 
flooding would pass through that natural base feature before it reached that building, then we counted that building as, as a building that received benefits. We did um, some statistical analysis with this across coastal Virginia, um, trying to decide how to, to develop, develop this ranking because there was some, you know, there's a great difference between some of our rural areas and some of our urban areas. Bottom line is, however, that there are many buildings in coastal Virginia that have no natural nature based feature between them and, and tidal waters. And so because the zero number was fairly large statistically, we ended up just ranking this low, medium, high according to zero buildings, one building and two or more buildings. Then we added in critical, critical facilities. We thought if a natural nature based feature was providing flood benefits for a school or a place that's identified as a shelter or um, a, you know, fire, um, firehouse, police station, um, you know, th those sort of critical facilities, hospitals, that that was easy. That was either a yes or no. And then our last ranking was about our co-benefits. Um, and I will give a detail on this co-benefits in a minute. But basically, it was the potential to provide um, extra co-benefits um, related to two different elements. And those elements are, oh, sorry, I'm going to pause for a minute. So um, the co-benefits potential for two different elements for basically water quality improvement and the community rating system credits. And so again, it's low, medium, and high if there's no co-benefits provided, if there's one or if there's two. And that ranking was simply added up to one, two, or three. And that's how we did our natural nature-based features ranking. And I thought I would pause for a minute because that was a lot of stuff um, and see if anybody had a question about the ranking before I move on to, to demonstrations. Any questions? No, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. You must be doing a wonderful job of explaining, Pam. <laughs> oh, thank you all. Okay, great. So I'm going to move on, I think. Yep, yeah, okay. So, um, I had actually meant for this slide to go before the last one, or right after the last one, the question slide was in the wrong place, my apologies. But nevertheless, this will provide a little more detail on those two go pet two co-benefits. So the first one is the FEMA community rated system. Um, this was an interesting um, co-benefit to try to develop a GIS mapping model for because it's difficult often to map a regulation. And so basically what we we're trying to do is develop a way to figure out how to get information that's relative and relevant to this question. So basically what it means is if you have undeveloped property in your flood special flood hazard area, and in Virginia, the resource protection area buffer is considered by FEMA to be included in that because it has regulatory protection. So basically you need undeveloped land and you need some level of protection of that undeveloped land to ensure that it doesn't become developed and provide a, and, and create additional risk for flooding for infrastructure flooding. So what we needed to do was then map the RPA. So this is, is a challenge. Um, there are some local governments in coastal Virginia that have done their own digital mapping. And when I get to that, I'll point that out. But where there were the few that were available, we used their existing data. For the other ones, we developed a mapping strategy. And when I get to the mapper, I'll explain that in more detail. But that was in order to be able to identify whether targets and or natural beach features might be providing some of that benefit. The second one is water quality potential. And we went really simple with this. Basically, we considered everything but beaches and dunes to provide um, a water quality potential. That's for a couple of reasons. First of all, because if they're vegetative features by and large, if they're wetlands, non-tidal or tidal wetlands or repairing wooded areas, those are already approved as Chesapeake Bay um, BMP for load reduction. So they've already been recognized as providing that service. Secondly, because of our study area is along the tidal shore, it's very likely that those features are going to be providing that service physiographically because they're going to sit right near the shoreline where, where, um, those, where they could receive credit or be considered providing that service. So now I'm going to take all that information and move into the tools bucket because this is where we have our interactive viewer. So this is where we're going to get into actually trying to see and being able to show 
the information of all those other buckets that I've been talking about. So the first um, bucket in ADAPT VA is sea level and flooding. And I have turned this on to have sea level and I've turned on the intermediate high. Um, as I said before, that one is, is considered sort of where we are working towards for a lot of Virginia's um, programs. And I set it to 2050. And um, this is a piece of um, Sarah's Creek in Gloucester County. So hopefully I've identified most of these areas for folks so they can see where you are. And so what happens is when you turn this on and you put your years, and this is a slider bar, so you can change it to whatever you want. If you select, if you actually click on the land anywhere that has some of the blue on it, and the blue is a color ramp, the darker blue is deeper and it gets lighter. The blue gets lighter, the water is shallower. What you can do is if you click on it, it will pull up a, a chart like this that shows you what the water surface is above the land elevation. So we've used digital elevation models. So the land elevation and then that water surface is modeled to sit on top of whatever that land elevation is. And this by subtraction is the difference between what we think is the water depth, the projected water depth and the land elevation. So it shows you that by this point in the upper part of Sarah's Creek, for instance, by 2050, we'll have a foot of water um, at, at under normal sea level rise. So that there will be water where there was land um, by 2050 in this scenario. And so you can, you can do that throughout the coastal plain um, and you can pick your different scenarios here and you can pick your different years at the bottom. So now I wanna really focus in on the natural nature-based features information. So as I mentioned bef before, one of the things we mapped was our coastal facilities. So you find that information by clicking on the infrastructure tab and you have to turn on the infrastructure here and that will allow you to see critical facilities and coastal buildings. Um, I didn't open the legend for some of these because I can just explain it and it takes up a lot of space, but basically the maroon are the critical facilities. You can see this is a high school. It may also serve as shelter, I'm not, I'm not certain. And then all of the sort of bright gold, orangey colors are the buildings. I would point out that this mask, this beige is masking out what is not in our study area. So that means that these elevations are, are above 10 feet. Um, and so as you obviously could expect as you move to the intercoastal plain, localities will have less and less of the elevation below 10 feet and, and the inner outer coastal plain localities will have more area that's um, below 10 feet. It also, if you use the eyes on these data layers, it will pull up information and tell you what that, where that data comes from. So in this case, this is the, the Virginia Geographic Information System footprint data set and the Virginia land cover data set together that goes into this particular data. So you are able to do that for all of the data that's served in ADAPT VA if you want to find out where it comes from. Um, the other thing I didn't do a screen capture of, but I would just point out is there is a how-to down here. And when that opens up, there's lots of questions. How do I find this? How do I ask this question? So that's a really helpful um, tool to be aware of as well. I just am not highlighting it today. So um, the next thing I wanted to, to show you all is um, how we mapped the RPA buffer. So this is the resource protection area buffer. So it's the 100 foot landward of all of the RPA features. And we did it using um, land use because the idea again is to find out what might be in that space might be available to convert to a natural nature based feature with the focus likely being on turf grass and agricultural and perhaps open space, depending on what that land cover is. But it also tells, um, allows the locality to determine how much open space they have in their RPA, if they wanted to be able to calculate that information to work towards community rating service credits. Again, I've turned on, um, this is a part of PCOS and I've turned on the, um, the all buffer. So the all buffer, the dark, dark red bits are either pavement or houses. So that's developed land. So here and here, the, um, as I said, the green is open space. This doesn't, this particular screen capture doesn't have any of the agricultural color in it. So this, this example doesn't 
doesn't have this land use in it. And again, with the I, you can go in and find out where that land use came from. As I said before, with the RPA buffer, it we're using an individual um, VGIN land cover set. The localities, if it's their buffer, we and it's digitally data data is available digitally. We use theirs. Otherwise, we created the RPA buffer using the tidal marsh inventory, the national wetlands inventory, and the national hydrography data set. Um, this is as allows us to have to create the buffer landward of tidal marsh, adjacent non-tidal wetlands, and or free flowing streams that are attached to tidal water. So those are the three data sets that we used. So a little bit more specific, um, drilling down a little bit more. So this is just drilling down into the, the same view I was using and I've actually selected. So you are able to click on the layers and you will get a pop-up that tells you more information about the layer. And so in this case, being that it's the, the RPA, we do note that this does not represent a jurisdictional boundary. Our RPA map is not unlike a national wetlands inventory map or a tidal marsh inventory map. It is a likelihood of location that has to be conferred and, and um, verified on the ground. And, but again, it, it lets you see sort of what that space is and whether you have open space and whether you'd be able to potentially receive um, credits for the community rating system. So I want to move now to the natural nature-based features ranking piece of, of the story. So I have got a screen capture here and I have the legend up. And so now I'm in the protection and restoration opportunities bucket. So we've had infrastructure, we had um, shoreline management was what the RPA is, and this is where the restoration protection. So the first one is lands for protection. So how are our natural nature based features ranked? So this is a map and it shows we go from most benefits to many benefits to some benefits, a really simple ranking. I have selected a feature here. It happens to be a beach. And so when you select your feature, you get a pop-up of information about it. It tells you the four elements that we've used in our ranking, and as I explained earlier, whether it has the capacity to mitigate coastal flooding, um, buildings that it protects, if any of those buildings are critical features, and the co-benefits of water quality and CRS credits. I would also note that we have linked this process to a fact sheet and I'll have this highlighted. And what it allows you to do is click through that link and get to a page um, that's served on, on, on CCRM at BIMS. And we have NNBF fact sheets. So for each of our um, 11 natural nature based features. We have developed a fact sheet. They're all built the same. It provides a description of, of what the natural feature is, the benefits that that feature tends to provide, information about restoring or creating that feature, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, links to information about how that might work, and then um, information about our two, two co-benefits, so water quality, BMPs, or community rating system benefits. And as I pointed out, we have one for each. So this is our, our forest, our woodlands. This is our scrub shrublands. Then we have our wetland types, our forested wetlands, our scrub shrub wetlands, our non-tidal marsh, and then we have tidal marsh, and then we have our three living shorelines. I also wanted to point out that each of these features has the iconography that was created and it links to the icons on the CCRM website so you can quickly see which feature you're looking for if you look for the icon. <coughs> Excuse me. Pause. So um, now I want to switch to the other side of the project. So we talked about how we identified existing features and rank them. Now we want to figure out where we might identify targets for restoration and protection. So the way we did this was, um, and this is being served. So if I had opened this box up, you would have at the top of the box, it would say protection opportunities now and restoration opportunities. And these are targets for natural nature-based features to benefit coastal buildings. 
So what we chose for our target was any spot along the shoreline where our waters were flooding and there was a building that had no natural nature-based feature intercepting that water, that became a target. So you can see I've captured the same view that I had pretty much um, before for the NMBF targeting. Only, so now I'm in the Lower Hampton. The red um, bullets are the targets where you get a thing that looks like this. What you basically has is a, have a row of targets that overlap each other. The target areas that we actually mapped are 100 foot round circles. And we chose the 100 feet because of the relationship to the 100 foot buffer. And the 100 feet um, is, is um, uh, the diameter around where the shoreline is mapped at that location. And there's, there's some reasons for that. So drilling down into, into that area a little bit more. So here's our target area. In this case, these are two, there's two or three targets. Um, what happens when you, you can click, click and select one of these targets. And if, when this thing, when your box information box pops up, if it has numbers and arrows at the bottom, it means that you can click through and you can see the different things that you've selected if you've managed to select more than one. So I thought I'd share that piece as well. So this gives you the target areas you can see. And then I've also, in this case, turned on the coastal buildings just so you can see the relationship of the targets to the buildings. So basically in an area like this, you might imagine that you can see maybe a little bit of green here. So there's some wooded that's protecting, you know, providing some benefits to these buildings. But this area, being that it's a marina, um, is probably all commercially developed, which means that buildings back here that may or may not receive floodwaters through that path um, have no natural nature based features. So that becomes a target. If you select a target, what you will do is identify the features that we've used to rank that target. So in this case, if you were to do a restoration for a natural nature-based feature here, you would, at a, you would provide benefits to 20 buildings, including three with no benefits. As I mentioned before, remember our targets are focused on really this number right here. If this says at least one, it's gonna be a target. If there's one building that has no natural nature-based feature interceding waters, it will be tar uh, become a target. Um, then the next piece of the information is, so what to do about it? So if we wanted to do an NMBF restoration, what, what can we focus on? So in this case, it tells you what the land use land cover within your target is. So in this case, impervious and grass, if the land use land cover had been wooded, it wouldn't be a target. Um, the target is only, in areas where the existing land use land cover is developed or open or, or turf grass basically, or ag. Um, it tells you what nearby natural nature based features are on the ground. Um, the reason that this is important is um, the scientific understanding that restoration is often most successful if you're mimicking or creating something that's nearby. Also, if you're adding additional space to a feature. So in other words, if you're extending it or elongating it, that provides additional services, especially from a habitat perspective. And then finally, um, with our natural nature-based features information targets, we provide a link to the CCRM shoreline management model. The shoreline management model um, is a model that's, that's a geographic information system based model that incorporates 15 some criteria into making a recommendation about a preferred alternative for erosion control. Um, now, while erosion control is not inherently always related to flood benefits and or water quality and or CRS credits, they often do overlap and provide some of the same because the, the feature that provides those things provides multiple benefits. So in other words, if you have a tidal marsh, it also provides water quality benefits. It can help minimize coastal erosion. It can buffer some floodwaters. And so basically, if you are able to identify something that would put, be put on the shoreline here, you can get those additional benefits. So we do create um, a click through. Now I point out with this wooded one, if you click on that, it will go to the same fact sheets you saw before. Um, if you click on the natural nature based features, it takes you to the CCRM webpage that talks about the shoreline management, or sorry, yeah, the erosion control shoreline management one. And then finally, it says if you can enhance the existing shoreline because there are existing structures in this target, 
there's a bulkhead or that meant somewhere within that target that you might be able to add some natural elements to those features. So a little bit um, more detail on something else that we've provided around the targets is a second project that we have just recently completed at, at the Center for Coastal Resources Management. It was a living shorelines was a living shoreline suitability it was a living shorelines ranking for where living shorelines were considered suitable so we took all of the living shorelines that were mapped as suitable by the shoreline management model we developed a ranking for for them and um, and we used a very similar approach we we developed four criteria for our ranking for living shorelines the first was nutrient reduction potential and this basically is the bigger the marsh, the higher the potential. In other words, it's just sort of aerial extent. And so if a living shoreline has a longer reach, we use the same width for the for all of our living shorelines. We created polygons of about eight feet, um, which is sort of a minimum recommendation related to the group two permit, general permit in Virginia. So we started with sort of that basic recommendation. So all of our polygons are the same width, but they may be different lengths. So in this case, the one I've highlighted, it tells you exactly that it's 1,500, almost 1,600 feet long, always eight feet wide. Um, but because it's one of our bigger areas that if the whole thing was put together, it would receive a high nutrient reduction potential. Then we did a habitat continuity piece. And basically this was ranking um, high, moderate, and low. And if the living shoreline is proposed for a place where there is existing native marsh adjacent or created marsh for that matter, existing marsh adjacent, it would be high because we'd be creating um, a, a continuity of tidal marsh. You'd be creating a linear feature of the tidal marsh continuity. If it's adjacent to um, any of our other natural nature-based features, be it the wooded ones or non-tidal adjacent wetlands, any of the other features, it gets ranked moderate. If it's adjacent to no other natural features, it would be ranked low for habitat continuity. And then we it used benefits for local buildings. So this is basically the same thing as the benefits from our natural nature of these features assessment. And then finally, we included our social vulnerability data. And if the feature happens to be in a census block that's ranked as socially vulnerable for high, it would be high. For moderate, it'd be moderate. For low, it'd be low. So in this case in Hampton, this particular one is ranked low. And so what happens is, because you are able to look at both of these things at the same time, you can see I still have my targets on. I still have my living shorelines on. So in this case, what I see is that my that the targets and the living shoreline show you where, where your target could be a living shoreline and what benefits you would get from that. So what it does is it informs the targeting piece just a little bit extra by telling you exactly by linking the, the shoreline management model output to that. So the living shoreline stuff, um, the targets are orange. So the blues and the greens are the living shorelines and their ranking are the blues are, are the rank the highest, the greens are the lowest, and then this pale, or the greens are the middle, and then this pale, very pale green beige is the lowest. So why are we looking to target the shoreline? Um, I've given you several reasons, but I'm going to summarize it. So basically, it's the first line of defense. Because these projects are both focused on tidal water flooding, whatever the tide hits first is going to be the most likely to be able to start to provide some sort of benefit. Secondly, because we're focusing on the shoreline, the anticipation is that you would be dealing with um, a resource protection area buffer, and so you're most likely to be able to get some programmatic benefits be it um, additional water quality improvement, or maybe you can get some TMDL credits and that might help create additional um, partnerships and opportunities to actually do a restoration in that location. And then, as I said before, we also have our shoreline management model to inform that, that information. So that's another reason. Um, as I would note, and I haven't turned it on in this particular instance of this screen capture from Hampton, but the 10 foot, um, study area would, would go far beyond the shoreline and it would there would be opportunities for additional natural nature based features restoration further up uphill if you will from the shoreline but we started with the shoreline because if if we were going to try to identify targets we were trying to figure out a way to find um, 
and an answer and a solution in a location that would be transferable and easily understood and have information behind it that would help create incentives and and provide um, guidance. So I want to just switch a little bit to um, the other part of the living shorelines model that came with the ranking, just to point out how that works really quickly. So um, I have a screen capture here and I have the shoreline management model turned on again. Now I'm in the shoreline management bucket where down below here would be our RPA choice. So you could put RPA behind this if you chose. And it tells you what the different outcomes are. And where I'm going to focus is on the features that are um, our living shorelines features. So they are categorized basically in three big categories, the non-structural living shorelines, in the quieter spaces where the fetch is low, uh, plant marsh with sill, and then maintain beach or offshore breakwater with beach. Now, because I'm in a small creek, this particular um, recommendation doesn't show up in this particular slide. But nevertheless, you get the point. Um, and the, the um, information about the living shorelines that, that links to this, this page that um, provides a lot of information about designs, alternatives, vegetative choices, the research behind laws and policies. Um, a screen capture of, or a map of the output of that shoreline management model identifies that the majority of Virginia shoreline is, is probably suitable. It's, it's quote, you know, somewhere in the 70% range um, because much of the shoreline has a moderate to low energy much of these little sort of small crenulations and creeks have you know fairly low fetches and there are a lot of existing marshes and beaches which are indicative of the fact that you could probably create a marsh or beach in those locations i would also note that there are quite a few areas of special consideration this is a piece of our model that highlights um, sort of where where the shoreline recommendation might bump up against other regulatory or other um, ecosystem limitations. Um, in this case, it's generally SAV. There will be and is some interest in trying to, to resolve some and work through some of the that conflict. So I'm just highlighting that because there may be an opportunity to, to try to figure out some solution there moving forward. So when you flip back to um, the CCRM website, that has um, all of the information about the natural base features that I mentioned before with the icons. The other thing that we're serving there, in addition to the fact sheets, are coastal uh, locality resilience summaries. So we have done four of these so far. We've made some, some um, edits and modifications and are now going back and generating all the rest of them. So hopefully they'll be done within the next three or four weeks. So I'm just giving you an example of this one as sort of a summary of what those look like. So each locality will have um, a small map and the map will have the target. So you can see this is the study area in orange, the targets are in blue. There is a summary of the natural nature-based features within that locality that occupy the greater landscape. So it doesn't mean that they only have tidal marsh, wooded shrub shrub and some hybrid living shorelines. There could be other features on the list, but we picked the ones with the greatest um, statistical distribution. We include hybrid living shorelines on our, the living shorelines bucket will show up on every list just because we know that that's an area of great interest. And so we will always include this one. And then these four will be the, the ones that are the greatest surface area within that locality. We provide some information on the coastal area for, for that all the elevation that's below 10 feet. For instance, what percent of the locality is that area? So for James City County, 14% of the county is below an elevation of 10 feet. The coastal buildings, the critical facilities in that area, coastal buildings without natural base features and targets. Then we also provide information on the fact sheet about the Chesapeake Bay air, um, buffer area. So how many acres of that county are in the Chesapeake Bay buffer area? And then how much of that is turf grass that may be convertible? So James City County has a fairly large um, number of acres within their RPA buffer, but not as large of an area relative to um, 
the whole area that could be converted, which probably means that a lot of their buffer might already be in wooded or our other natural covers. And then finally, this bucket down here gives you an example of how many acres of natural nature-based features are providing specific benefits. So in this case, we have um, you know, almost 2,300 acres in James City County for decreasing flooding risk for buildings, um, almost 12, well, 11, over 11,000 acres that are providing water quality improvements, and then how many acres might be eligible for CRS credits. And again, we have these icons that crosswalk to the C CCRM website. So um, I was going to try to actually go to the website now if, um, if folks are interested and see if there's an opportunity to um, do some questions like look things up or ask questions or, you know, um, Pam, right, be right before we do that, we do have one question uh, okay. that came in from Robert Shendock. Um, he asked it right before you started talking about identifying NNBFs, but I think uh, it's applicable to all of the interactive maps. Um, he said graphics are necessary, but are the data values as per the key available for capture? You mean, can you generate report? So is that question mean can you generate a report or is the data available for download you know uh robert i've unmuted you so if you want to ask your question go right ahead a report okay um i see that in the in the in the chat so right now we do not have a report generator, but that is a great idea. We do have it on another tool. We have been working for about eight years, maybe even more, with the Department of Environmental Quality on a tool called WetCat, which is the Wetland Condition Assessment Tool. And it is used by DQ in regulatory review of wetland projects. And it has a report generator. So thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to see what we can do about that. As far as the data availability, it is all available. So um, on that how-to box that I mentioned that I hadn't opened, which I could open um, here. Can you all see the, 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 the website that I'm loading? We can. Are you able to share the website or I can do it for you, Pam, if you'd like. Okay, hold on, let me, let me do this. Can you see it now? It is taking just a second, but I think we do. Okay, it's loading. Okay, yes, we see that. Because I did forget to open it before. Um, I was going to show that all of the data is downloadable. Um, so I'm actually on campus. I'm not sure why it's taking so long. If it's gonna be difficult, we'll have to find a workaround. Um, perhaps somebody else has another question. Let's see if I can. or I can stop sharing. Let's see if I can. Loading, this is Elizabeth. Are there um, any other future plans for expansion of ADAPT VA that you all have in mind? So, yes, um, you know, as I mentioned, I think that we, we definitely are interested in going through and adding um, an update to our legislative table. I'm gonna stop for a minute and see if it will load without being shared. Um, and we also are looking at some additional information about, um, we have a major, uh, a large project right now working with the Virginia Department of Transportation on um, some road, road information and road flooding. And we've done some road transportation network systems analysis for um, under the, with the Coastal Zone Management Program, which allows an understanding of how you get to certain things and, and how flooding might prevent you from being able to access certain areas. And um, both of those pieces of information are going to be eventually on um, serve. So um, I'm not sure at this point exactly where those things will be, 
but um, yeah, and so there's, there's yeah, a lot of you, uh, yeah. You all are doing quite a bit of work on septic analysis as well. Will that end up being housed on a DAV VA as well? So right, so and groundwater. Um, groundwater wells. So um, my mapper did just open up. So I'm going to go back to share the screen really quickly. Um, while we ask, while we answer those questions, now that I can focus. Um, yeah, so there's actually quite a few different kinds of efforts that are going on right now. What I would say is that it doesn't necessarily mean that they will all be in this specific viewer. Um, we're, we're right now trying to get an understanding when we first started ADAPT VA, um, uh, VCPC and Wetlands Watch did a lot of sort of outreach with local governments on how they best wanted to be able to access viewer and everybody kept saying they wanted it all in one bucket. Um, and the scientists at CCRM kept saying, are you sure you want it all in one bucket? And they kept saying, yes, we do. So we created this viewer where everything's all in one in one bucket. Um, but it appears that we are most likely going to be creating a second viewer and it may or may not involve moving some things around. So for instance, when our natural nature-based features project took off, this, this area here that I'm putting my cursor around, protection restoration opportunities, didn't exist. That VA was these five. Um, the viewer was these five. And we had to create that new area to serve the data that we had just developed. And so as we continue to develop data, we will be seeking feedback and input from our our customers, basically our clients, on how they want to be able to get to that data. So that's still an important part of, of how we're doing this, is to make it so it's as use, useful and usable as possible. Um, so I was going to show, since I'm live, I was going to look up, um, we talked about this stuff the other day. So um, unless somebody wants to put in the chat an address, I was going to look up. Um, we had a couple of places we thought we'd start with. If I can type. So you can zoom in, obviously, as I just did. So you can type anything. And here's your how do I, um, which is really great because you can you can do some measurements on the map. You can see the layers. You can find out about all the information layers. You can select layers, show the legend. You can change the base map if you ever wanted to do that. This box down here. So we use VGIN imagery, but you can change it to hybrid, to streets, to topography, to navigation. You know, really, you can have a great time with changing your background. We tend to always use pretty much this background generally. It will tell you what the scale is when you're zoomed into any place. So if you wanted to get a relative understanding of what you're looking at, this is the Brock Center in Virginia Beach. Um, you can print. You can open the print tool here um, and you can export like a, a graph, but that's not necessarily a report as we were talking about before, but you can print out a graph. Um, you can hide the toolbar, you can navigate around the map, learn about all the things, learn about practices. So pretty much everything here, here's your download, here's your disclaimer, here's your ask questions. So um, you can always email um, this address and get questions answered. So that's a really helpful thing. That's our, our how-to bucket. So if you wanted to see, for instance, um, where the natural nature-based features are around the Brock Center, I'll zoom out once more. So you can see that we're in Virginia Beach in the Lone Haven River. And if we turn on our lands for protection, turn our coastal NMBS, um, that's what it looks like. So this, um, and as I pointed out before, here's our natural nature beast features. Here's the legend with the color ramp. So the, the these, I think everything showing here is either moderate or most or many. This might be a low right here. And then you want to find out about that, that feature, you click on it. And as I pointed out in the, in the talk, it will open up the window. And then here's this live click through to the fact sheet. Um, generally, our windows open up, I will point this out too, in new windows. We've always, we've designed it so it usually always opens in a new tab. So you, you don't arrow back, so you don't lose where you were. 
So you can easily just go back to where you were and this is a new tab. So we've tried to do that for most, that was some feedback we got early on. Um, and then if you wanted to turn on restoration opportunities, you could do that. Um, I have little charts turn on targets. Obviously it's working fairly quickly for me because I'm on campus. I understand it might take a little time. There is a lot of data. This is a very data, very data dense tool, um, which is why with Elizabeth's question about some of the transportation information, the septic information, the groundwater information, all being infrastructure related, we've been talking about creating that as a separate viewer um, with still probably with the sea level rise flooding risk, but with the infrastructure, and then this might even change. You know, I'm not, not exactly sure. Um, we haven't finished some of that work yet, so we haven't made the plans as of yet. Um, but this gives you Pam, an example of what that looks like. Pam, there is a request in the chat for you to look uh, at a particular address. Okay. It's 233 Judith Sound, two different words, Judith Sound Circle in Lotsburg. All right, so here's Judah Sound Circle. It's right underneath a target. Looks like, I'm gonna zoom out just a touch. Um, I'm gonna turn on, so there's a beach. There we go, turn this on, okay, so. I'm not sure what that's going to Here we go. There's our beach. So there's a beach that kind of comes up and touches that particular address, but it appears to mostly stop now. And understandably, with the mapping for things like beaches, they are one of our harder things to map um, because often they're underwater. Uh, with the narrow beaches that are intertidal, so intertidal sand, we try to capture the best way we can. Um, the beaches that we have in this data set were created mostly from observed aerial imagery. So we actually had to create much of our beach data set um, as part of our comprehensive coastal inventory. So in this case, it looks like we have it. Um, yeah, we have a target. So I'm not sure why we can't click on it. That's odd. There we go. There's our target. Okay. So um, it says one building will benefit. So that, that particular house does not have any natural nature beach features. It does have the land covers and pervious and turf grass. The recommendation is for a beach and which would go back to that same information sheet. And then here, the shoreline management recommendation for that target is um, a breakwater and it sends you, so now you can see where it sends you to this page so you can actually see what that is. So since it said, maintain beach or offshore breakwater, you can go to this list here and read what that means. Um, and then you can also find more information about, about that in your, back here. Um, you can also find more information if you click beach, which is what it's suggesting you create. And then you can go to the resources and you can read about beach nourishment and dune restoration. So that was, a, that was a great example. And thank you for that, John. And then Pam, another question that's come in is, so what is the goal as you develop this tool? Is it to assist an individual parcel owner to look at the NMBF options? Is it to assist a locality in planning how to use their conservation funds and uh, restoration funds or all the above? So it's really, it's really, all the above. The, the ranking, the NNBF ranking is, um, from our perspective, most valuable to the local governments. It really highlights the services, um, at least three of the services that natural based features provide. So the flood benefits piece, the, um, the water quality benefits piece, and the potential for CRS credits, which is an, is, is an actual financial incentive. So that's a pretty powerful uh, piece of information. And so in making decisions about land use changes or permitting or site plan review, having information about the importance of the 
the services and you know we didn't even yet and so moving forward with our natural base feature stuff um, normally i include a slide but i didn't this time what might you add next well we haven't accommodated or accounted for um, habitat or rte species or some of the other services you know the people are starting to talk about value valuing open space and aesthetics and recreation services you know there's been lots of work done on that so obviously we could add additional ranking features to our nnbf ranking and 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 maybe tease out a little bit more um, so it really highlights what the services are that those existing features provide so that's really, um, I think, valuable information more for the local government perhaps than the individual. The targets, I think, can be useful for both the individual and the land and the um, local government because local governments often participate in or review proposals about what is going on again along the shoreline. And if it's if one thing is is going to potentially get extra benefits, then perhaps that's a reason to really encourage that that approach over another approach. So the perhaps the most obvious example is where a living shoreline gets you additional water quality benefits might be eligible. And there has been conversation about um, open space credit for CRS. And then obviously there's the water quality credit from the other ranking that I showed you that goes with the natural nature based features. So perhaps there's a way to provide some credits or incentives. Um, recognizing that those credits or incentives may not accrue directly to the property owner so there there has to be some sort of process or context in which those um, benefits can can be accrued both to the property owner and the local government so i think that um, the idea is that the information would be useful and valuable to to both Thank you. Also, um, there was a question about the Brock Center that you showed first, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Brock Center. Yeah. Um, wasn't that in the um, RPA? And um, you have layers that indicate the RPA, correct? But do you have something that shows that there's an IDA under the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, an intensely developed area? Yeah, we do. So I was going to try to go one, six. Oh, I have the wrong number typed in. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, I will switch back to that one. All right, so here's the Brock Center. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. Um, this one's good, actually, you can see that there's some wooded areas. So there's some wooded areas here that may not have gotten picked up on originally on our original imagery. It's sort of hard with some of these things. Now, I will tell you that the wooded, that the land use land cover is from the Virginia Geographic Information System. So it's their mapping. We did do a lot of work to try to make the wooded land cover as precise as possible. They had several different categories of, of tree cover and forest, but we found so much statistical sort of variability that we actually, we created a layer called wooded because they had one called forest and one called tree and one called tree zone. Anyway, they had two or three different covers and statistically they're, anyway, you know, we have we have some folks that are, are highly skilled in, um, understanding land use land cover data. So we did our best. So, but it's funny because I might have called this wooded, but it could be scrub shrub. I'm just noting that out loud. But um, so if you go to shoreline management and we turn on our RPA, and we open that up and we do all buffer. Um, this is what the buffer shows right now. So it actually doesn't show it in the buffer, but I don't know how you know, I, it depends on how we classify this area here um, as marsh or not. And so that obviously ends up being the big, the big thing. See, so right now we have tidal marsh out here. And if I turn on non-tidal, um, which is gonna take a long time to load, but um, I think it did load, I don't know. Yeah, it must have. So, I'm not sure how um, remote information is, is categorizing this, this sandy area because when you do remote data imagery, that's the, one of the areas that it sort of is, is hard, as I mentioned, is the sandy soils. Um, you know, people are using vegetative colors as signatures to do um, classification and computers are taught 
to do computer learning to do that classification. And so a spot like this is, is a little bit hard. Um, so, so that actually makes for a good example, um, if you will, on some of the limitations of the mapping. But um, on the other hand, this whole thing apparently is in the buffer because it's not more than 100 feet wide on either side. So, so that's a good example. I don't know if anybody has any more questions. Yes, I see we're at 1121. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to post in the chat box? And of course, if you do, as we move on to the next topic, if you have questions that come to you, please, or comments, suggestions, please post them. We're going to be monitoring that. So thank you, Pam. That was excellent. I know that was a long haul for you and a lot of technical stuff to explain. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as I noted in the chat box, we really are aiming this at our um, localities, our planning district commissions, and our natural resource colleagues at, our, at the state agencies. So you all are the folks whose eyes won't glaze over as Pam talks about all of this and can understand how these could be helpful to you, I hope. Um, our big goal is to introduce these tools to you and to see how they can help the localities, um, especially as we are in the uh, master plan process, the Coastal Resilience Master Plan. As you all know, that the governor called for through executive order. Um, you've heard now about ADAPT VA and all the many things it can do, and specifically the new NNVF tool. You've heard about the Marissa sheets, information sheets. Um, next, we're going to move on to something that's called a quick guide to resilience. And I want to give you just a little background on that before I introduce our summer fellow who's working on that. And I'm very excited about that, by the way. Sarah Henshaw is our first non law student summer fellow. Uh, she's an MPA student from North Carolina, as Gray mentioned, so we're very excited that she's working with us this summer. Um, so as the master plan process uh, got rolling, um, Admiral Ann Phillips went out and spoke to the coastal PDCs, as you all know, and said, send us the prioritized resilience projects from the localities. And questions came back about, how do you want us to assess that? You know, what different topic areas are we looking at? For example, housing, transportation, socially vulnerable communities, you know, how do we make sure we're all looking at the same topics, et cetera? And so uh, she began a discussion with our team. You do a project called the Raft that many of you all have heard of. Uh, we're currently doing it with the Northern Neck PDC in the Northern Neck region, did it before with the Eastern Shore PDC and about to launch in the Middle Peninsula with the MP PDC. It's the resilience, um, adaptation feasibility tool. And it's, an, it's a process where you work with localities, score how resilient their programs and policies are, and then work with them for a year to help them with connecting them to grant opportunities, uh, providing some legal uh, research if they need it, et cetera. Um, and so we had a discussion with her about the potential for maybe taking that RAF framework and adapting it to be a self-assessment tool that localities could use if they want. It's not required in any way, of course. Localities can use whatever method they want to come up with their prioritized list of resilience projects. But one way to help them could be to provide this tool. So we've developed something called the PREP tool. We're not gonna present that today. We're, uh, our hopes to have it done by the end of the summer. But I just want to make you aware of that because Separately, um, at our 2019 annual VCPC conference, um, for those of you all who are there, you may recall that we had some panels of uh, speakers from other states talking about their resilience planning efforts. And the uh, Deputy Chief Resilience Officer for North Carolina uh, talked about a quick guide to resilience that they developed that caught the ear of the Director of the Virginia Environmental Endowment. And he asked us to look into that and see is there something we could do like that for Virginia? So we've developed a draft quick guide to resilience and we are trying to also make it a tool that could help as people, if they do decide, if a locality does decide to use this prep tool we've developed to do a self-assessment to come up with prioritized projects, um, that it could be a handy reference for that as well. So it could be used on its own or it could be used in coordination with the prep tool. So hopefully we'll assist localities as you move forward to try to get funding from the Community Flood Preparedness Fund for either capacity building and planning, for projects, for studies. Again, these, the goal is to provide you with tools to help you along this path to resilience. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, hey, everybody. So my name is Sarah Henshaw. 
I graduated from UNC Chapel Hill with an undergraduate degree in environmental studies, and I'm now a graduate student in the UNC School of Government um, I'm in my second and final year of their public administration program. And so like everybody said, I'm interning as a summer fellow this summer at the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. Um, I've been working on the quick guide that I'm about to chat with you all about, as well as the prep tool that Elizabeth mentioned, um, and also doing some research for the technical advisory committee for the Virginia Coastal Resilience Master Plan. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I just have two slides for you all. Um, let's see. All right, hopefully everybody can see that okay. <laughs> um, okay, great. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, the quick guide is a guide designed to offer quick resiliency related resources for local governments and citizens. And the quick guide was originally started by Ryan Franklin, who was a BCPC practicum two student. And then I have been reworking and finalizing it ever since then. And like Elizabeth mentioned, the funding for the quick guide to resilience was provided by the Virginia Environmental Endowment. So the quick guide is divided into six kind of broad topics and every item in each of these topics contains hyperlinks offering a more in-depth discussion of key terms, offering information and examples specific to Virginia um, when those are available. And our goal for this guide is to kind of just be a one-stop shop um, for everything resilience related, having you know, everything in one place that is important to be considered for resilience measures in Virginia. And I think it's gonna be most helpful to kind of just go ahead and pull up the quick guide and go through all the sections and some of the links so you all can see how it should be used. And I'm gonna highlight a few of the links along the way just to give some examples of the kinds of information that we've decided to include that we thought would be useful for you all. Um, and I am gonna read through all the included sections just so that you all can have a full understanding of what's there and potentially what's missing. Um, so as we go through, I'd love for you all to just keep an eye out for anywhere you think or missing some information or missing some important links or just have some feedback to add because we would love to take any of that feedback at the end so we can incorporate it into this draft. Um, or even, you know, just feel free to put those um, in the chat or the Q&A as we go uh, through the guide. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the quick guide. There we go. All right, I'm hoping you guys can see this as well. Um, this is on Microsoft Word and I've zoomed in quite a bit. So hopefully you all can see some of the words as we, as I scroll through. Um, but just gonna go ahead and dive right in. Um, this is the quick guide to resilience. Um, we start out by uh, just defining resilience and the purpose of the quick guide. And then you can see here, we list the six topics and just kind of give a quick explanation of what they entail. And so diving into our first topic, um, it is essential links. So this section contains critical resources concerning flooding, sea level rise risk and resilience measures in Virginia. Um, so you can see here of, of the largest chunk of links here is from ADAPTDA, which I'm sure you all are familiar with now since Pam just uh, went over that uh, in detail. Um, but we just in include a few pages from the site like forecasts, uh, planning and policy and tools, the ones that she just went through. Um, we also have a link here for the prep tool that Elizabeth mentioned, um, since our hope is that the quick guide and the prep tool can be used in tandem once they are both uh, completed and listed. Um, and then here, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna be clicking on links throughout this. So you all just uh, bear, bear with me as I uh, switch my sharing over. There we go. Um, so I just thought I would share this. Um, this is the Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resiliency. Uh, which is available through a partnership with BCPC VIMS and Old Dominion. And it provides some scientific and technical support for state agencies, localities, and other entities um, in furtherance of recurrent flooding resiliency. So they conduct studies, provide uh, training, and offer a variety of services in the area of recurrent flooding resilience. Um, I just wanted to highlight, if you go to projects and reports here, so you guys could see that. Um, you can just see all the reports they have posted on this website just in one place, ranging you know, from studies on subsidence to the impact of severe weather on Hampton Roads housing market. Um, and I just thought that was useful to point out um, for Virginia localities, because these studies are very specific um, to that area. So let me get back out of that. I'll open back up quick. 
Okay, back to the quick guide. Um, so also listed on there are BEMS Comprehensive Coastal Resource Management Portals, a link for that, um, as well as Virginia Flood Risk Information System, the raft that Elizabeth just talked about, the website for that, um, and then also an intertidal jurisdiction chart, and then lastly, some projected sea level rise maps that can you know, help with planning. So moving into the next category, we've got causes of flooding. So this section is designed to kind of provide just quick definitions of factors causing and exacerbating flooding in Virginia. Um, so we define, you know, many of the causes of recurrent flooding and then provide the links to these definitions kind of just for further personal exploration on those terms. Um, so just kind of going through, we provided some information on sea level rise, storm surge, land subsidence, um, which plays a large role in flooding in Virginia in particular, um, increased precipitation, and then king tides. I'm actually going to pause on king tides. Um, so as you all probably know, uh, king tides are the, you know, the highest recorded tides of the year. And we've just given a couple links within this paragraph to help track those tides in order to help plan for those. Um, NOAA predicts these, these tides annually, but Virginia in particular is involved in Catch the King, which is the world's actually largest environmental survey. So I just actually want to open that up really quick just to give you guys an idea of that. There we go. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, but yeah, so uh, Catch the King utilizes crowdsourcing in order to, to map king tides, uh, the maximum inundation events of those, and then to improve um, and validate predictive models for these king tides. So you can see on the website, you can uh, register to volunteer to help out with that. And then also you can see here um, the king tide events for the last few years. This is for 2020. You can see those were in August and October, and you can see um, how high the flooding was. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then heading back to the quick guide, our last uh, part of this section is just going over the role of gray infrastructure and kind of exacerbating flooding, um, mainly relating to kind of traditional stormwater infrastructure, since that can decrease the amount of impervious surfaces um, and just kind of affect natural stormwater infiltration rates. And so now we get into the third section, um, which is policies and initiatives addressing flooding in Virginia. So this section summarizing, uh, summarizes planning efforts and policy in Virginia addressing recurrent flooding and it links the policies and just kind of highlights the main points of those. Um, so just kind of going through, the first here is the Virginia Coast Resilience Master Plan, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, is in the process of being developed and is scheduled to be released in November, I believe. And the framework has already uh, been issued, but you know the plan for this is to uh, be a roadmap for Virginia to become more prepared to mitigate future flooding along the coastline. Um, next, we link the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, of which about half of that revenue is apportioned to the Virginia Community Preparedness Fund, which is listed next there. Um, and that fund is intended to support coastal communities through low interest loans in their efforts to you know, reduce flooding and become more resilient. We also discussed the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program and the Chesapeake Bay Program Climate Resiliency Workshop. And so I kind of wanted to do a quick highlight um, of the Living Shoreline Mandate, which we have linked here. I'm going to go ahead and open that really quick. There we go. Um, so this is just the, the code from that, um, but that was adopted in 2020 to require local wetlands boards to approve living shorelines for shoreline stabilization projects instead of other methods, unless um, the best available science indicates it isn't feasible to build one in that area. Um, and I also quickly wanna share the want to share um, these updated wetlands guidelines. Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> there we go. Um, these are the updated wetlands guidelines from the Virginia Marine uh, Resources Commission. And those just give a better explanation of what, you know, that best available science is. And uh, list BIMS as the state science advisor and arbiter, arbiter um, in situations where there might be some back and forth over whether um, living shorelines are, are feasible in certain areas. 
Um, so lastly, we just linked the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act. And moving into our fourth uh, section, we uh, have strategies to mitigate flooding. So this is focusing on planning, adaptation, and gray and green infrastructure measures as tools to mitigate recurrent flooding. So the first section here, planning, um, it outlines comprehensive plans and highlights the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission in particular, um, which requires its localities to incorporate sea level rise and recurrent flooding into their comp planning. Um, and we've linked the most uh, recent comprehensive plans for those three cities uh, in the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission right here. Um, and then the adaptation section, uh, this highlights kind of three main things, uh, floodplain buyouts, uh, creating open space and then resilience oriented zoning ordinances. Um, sorry about that. Um, but so for floodplain buyouts, those involve the voluntary acquisition of flood prone properties. And we give uh, right here at the bottom, New Jersey's uh, Blue Acres floodplain acquisitions as an example of that. The creation of open spaces involves the removal of structures from flood prone properties after they've been acquired and then dedicating that empty property as open space like greenways or parks or wetlands to act as flood storage. Um, and we've given the city of Virginia Beach's open space program as a great example of that. And then lastly, uh, the resilience oriented zoning ordinances, um, those involve the creation of zoning ordinances to direct new development out of flood zones. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on the example we've given for that, which is the city of Norfolk's um, building a better there, I hope you all can see that. It's just a zoning ordinance there. And just to highlight that really quick, um, they've established a coastal resilience overlay zone where new development and redevelopment will have to comply with new flood resilience requirements. And we've also established, uh, they've also established an upland resilience overlay zone, which is designed to encourage new development in areas of the city that have a lower risk of flooding. And then lastly, they um, have created a resilience quotient, you know, framework in which developers can earn points for adopting different measures that promote risk reduction, stormwater management, and energy resilience. So I'm going to go back. The last two uh, strategies we've, we've listed on here are gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. Um, while you know green infrastructure is generally preferred and in some cases even required. Um, gray infrastructure sometimes may be necessary in certain circumstances, like, you know, when you're protecting valuable public infrastructure. Um, so, you know, we just go through in this section various types of gray infrastructure um, used for flood protection, um, but also discuss some of their drawbacks. So just to go through those really quick, we've listed seawalls, levees, riprap revetments, bulkheads, groins, breakwaters, and jetties. And and then go into discussing green infrastructure, um, options for that for flood protection and mitigation and discuss kind of their purposes. And we've linked right here, um, the natural nature based features tool that Pam just went over, um, specifically some of the fact sheets that she showed um, for NNBS, um, just for kind of looking into those, how they relate to these. Um, so here, I'm just gonna read through those. Um, we've listed constructed wetlands, swales, bioswales, living shorelines, marsh tow revetments, rain gardens, oyster reefs, beach nourishment, rain barrels, permeable pavement, marsh sills, and artificial, relief, artificial reefs. And so this is our second to last category. Um, we're getting into paying for resilience measures. So this section discusses funding strategies to pay for resilience measures, considering uh, private, local, state, and federal sources. Um, so in this first section, we discuss many types of bonds and what they entail. Um, so we've got uh, catastrophe bonds, general obligation and revenue bonds um, as municipal bonds, then environmental impact bonds. I'm going to click on this really quick. Um, these can also be called pay for success programs. Um, but I just wanted to show this quick link. There we go. Um, this just discusses what environmental impact bonds are and how the city of Hampton um, has, has utilized these types of bonds to finance three projects um, that reduce polluted runoff and flooding. So that's just a nice resource to have. And then we also discuss resilience bond and then another section of other funding mechanisms like public-private partnerships, parametric insurance, 
uh, local green banks. Here we uh, kind of showcase Virginia's legislation surrounding local green banks, which authorizes localities to enter into contracts to provide loans for the initial acquisition and installation of um, clean energy resiliency or stormwater uh, management improvements. Um, also service districts, stormwater utility fees, and then we get into Virginia specific funding legislation. I'm just gonna read through these so you all can see what, what we have and what we may be missing. Um, we've got the Virginia Dam Safety Flood Prevention and Protection Assistance Fund, the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, uh, Virginia Conservation Assistance Program funding through soil and water conservation districts, and then lastly, getting into some federal funding, um, we've got joint, joint use land studies, um, USDA grants, as well as HUD grants and some FEMA BRIC grants and uh, the US Army Corps of Engineer funding. Um, uh, the Army Corps has helped fund many programs in Virginia. So we just highlighted a few here, uh, like the Chesapeake Bay Oyster Recovery Program and Sandbridge Beach Renourishment Projects. Um, as well as the Bell Isle State Park Ecosystem Feasibility Study. And so lastly, um, getting into our last category is addressing the resilience needs of socially and physically vulnerable populations. So this section defines social vulnerability and discusses how it's typically measured and then provides some resources to help assess social vulnerability in your area. Um, so, you know, social vulner vulnerable groups are less resilient to physical hazards and they may face disproportionate losses from disasters. So communities really need to take socially or need to take socially and physically vulnerable populations into account um, and plan for their needs surrounding resilience measures. So here we've provided some interactive map links that help to assess vulnerability in coastal areas of Virginia. So I'm just going to I'm going to pull up this last one here just to give an example. But this is um, the surging seas risk zone map. And so how this works is you just type in, I'm going to type in Virginia Beach, type in an area that you're looking at. I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so we can see it a little better. And then you can see on the bottom here, um, there we go. Uh, there's a few different map layers and social vulnerability is one of those. So you just turn that on, you can see that there's low, medium and high social vulnerability. Um, and you can see kind of in what areas uh, those are. And then you can also here on the left, adjust the water level. And you can see as the water level rises, um, that social vulnerability becomes more intense. Um, so just wanted to share that. Um, but yeah, that is, that is the, the, just a quick run through of the quick guide to resilience. We really hope that the quick guide can help meet the needs of our target audience, which are localities as well as citizens, um, you know, helping them better understand the causes of flooding in Virginia, kind of provide a crash course in current planning and policy, addressing recurrent flooding in Virginia, as well as um, you know, explaining other strategies to aim in flood mitigation and give some examples of how those are currently being used in Virginia. Um, also offering some much needed funding sources at the local, state, and federal level. And then lastly, like I just talked about, you know, helping communities assess the, uh, their socially vulnerable populations in their communities. Um, and as I think Elizabeth mentioned earlier, the Quick Guide is in its final stages of development. Um, so it's not yet available to everybody, but when it is finalized, it's going to be featured on the VCPC website. Um, and will also be linked on the Adapt VA site. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, but I would love to take any feedback that you all have or questions. Um, and yeah. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, you did a great job, Sarah. Yes, absolutely. And um, please speak to anybody from the state natural resources agency see something we missed, any kind of funding program you'd like featured that we don't have. Again, keeping in mind what Sarah said and, and reiterating what I said in the chat box, we are trying to make this a quick guide. So we tried not to make it a, an encyclopedia of resilience, um, but something that would really be helpful to either a citizen who picked it up and wanted to know more about how to become, how their community can become more resilient or for a locality to use as a reference as they're going through the self-assessment tool about resilience projects. So any questions, um, corrections, uh, additions. 
George, we use uh, your shining example of Norfolk pretty frequently, I gotta say, you're leading the way. Um, oh, and he actually psychically is putting in the comments. Yeah, given the encyclopedic number of hyperlinks, calling it quick is a bit of, yeah. Well, we tried to, how many pages is it, Sarah? I think it's 14 now, but we just had Gray go through it and try to, try to you know, chop it down a little bit. So yeah. we, might be, we might be closer to 12 soon. <laughs> So a dozen pages, and that counts the cover, right? Or maybe not. So I don't know. So well, and and I think what we're trying to do with it is um, to sort of because right now, like we're we're thinking about the landscape of what's available, and it's huge, right? And, and that's one of the things that we talk about, sort of a knowledge cliff for a lot of people, is people are like, okay, I don't even know where to start with all of the information. Um, like obviously, we just had an hour long presentation on some of our tools. We had another presentation on some tools. There's so much information out there. Um, so I am actually delighted at the idea that we got it down to 14 pages, um, but really sort of saying like, how do I start? You know, like if you're learning a language and that's what we are learning right now is this language of resilience. We are understanding the tools to access that language. We are having conversations in this new language. And so, you know, this is our, this is our short dictionary. This is your I'm going to go ask my taxi driver how to get somewhere. That's what we're trying to accomplish with our quick guide. Um, and so, yes, would it be amazing if we could have all of the things that we could ever need in one page? Fantastic. Um, but it's it's wonderful and exciting that there are so many resources available. So what we're trying to do is compile some of those, give you some definitions. Here are some of the ideas that we're talking about. And here are some of the buzzwords, because a lot of times that's an issue too, is that we have these buzzwords that some of us who speak the language, like we're very familiar with that, um, but like gray infrastructure, you know, that is not infrastructure with my name on it. That is in fact a whole category of things that, you know, we have to learn how to talk about. So that's kind of what we're trying to do is give folks a starting place to say, okay, here is your, your key, here is your quick guide, go forth and learn. And I would like to think that, or hope that in the future, as we develop the master plan, and then subsequent iterations of the master plan. It would be great if the website that I think the administration is hoping to have fleshed out for that at some point, uh, will have info on things like funding resilience, et cetera, but we're not there yet. Um, so this is the first step towards that. Um, so anyone have some suggestions or thoughts? And uh, again, if you think about it and wanna send an email later to us with a suggestion for an addition or a deletion, please don't hesitate. We would love to get your feedback. Um, you might consider this link. Wait, I keep up, I keep up. Yes, oh, silver thanks, jackets. Peter. Silver jackets, definitely something we want to think about. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Their flood risk guide. Um, perfect, okay. And then Gray put actually her email in the chat box in case anyone has suggestions that they think of later or want to take time later to send. So are there any um, suggestions or comments, questions about um, the quick guide or about the NMBF tool or the Marissa sheets or anything else, ADAPT VA? Um, and by the way, I would add, if you have any suggestions for tools that have not been developed that you think are really needed, we would love to hear about that too. And I know our colleagues would as well at VIMS. Um, the next step things to work on, as Pam noted, they are looking at groundwater and septic issues, which are not sexy, but super important um, as another uh, set of data that can be included in ADAPT VA and the mapping. Um, so, um, Robert, can you help me out um, just to understand? So as we're thinking about tools that we can work on and develop um, and with Pam and with Elizabeth, um, when we say there's a need for numerical data, um, is that sort of data that we're using to inform applications for funding? Is that data that we're using to, to pull from one source and input it into another tool? What, what is the, the need for data? How do we need to use that? Oh, for comp plan development. Okay. Really, really. So we're needing that data to inform um, sort of when we're thinking about comprehensive planning, like we can show county leadership or locality leadership, like here's the data, here's the information that is specific to our area, um, then we can use that to sort of inform how our comp plans are gonna tackle resilience. Is that, and I'm getting that right? And, and Pam, do you wanna say something about that? I, 
I turn on my camera. Um, so I think that perhaps one thing that's under development also right now, um, the we're partnering with BCPC on the um, so the guidance for the new Chess Bay regulation, and our side of it is the data side. So we are working right now on some projections for mapping at least the 2050 because that's the the um, the date that's in the regulation. So so hopefully that information will be available soon, um, and that can be incorporated and used for comp plans. So that will be where we are are going to map what we intend what we anticipate as the 2050 distribution for wetlands um, and the buffer relative to those wetlands so that might be helpful for that and just in case there's anyone that wasn't quite sure what pam was referencing the general assembly this year amended the chesapeake bay preservation act to say that climate change impacts should be taken into account and the um, Virginia Department of Environmental Quality presented a regulation to the State Water Control Board at the end of June, which they adopted to uh, implement that mandate. So uh, we will be facilitating and assisting a stakeholders group over the coming few months to come up with guidance to further flesh that out. Um, and there was, is there another comment? Oh yeah, the roadway analysis where we're excited to see that too, Pam, um, added to the DAPBA. So roads, septic, groundwater, what are we missing? Anything? Um, we did have another question for Jay, uh, or a, a comment. Uh, I think Jay is asking us about a tool about salinity changes of water uh, within the coastal zone due to increased water. I'm thinking that that's probably increased freshwater. Um, but Jay, help me out um, if you have clarification on that question. He may mean uh, increasing salinity because of saltwater intrusion into our wells with sea level rise. Um, let me know if that's what you meant, Jay. So Pam, did you want to address that? Um, sure, so right, so increased water could be additional, okay, so salt push. Um, yeah, so the anticipation is that um, the groundwater work and the septic work is very much related to the fact that when our groundwater um, comes in and and the as salt water intrusion um, and excursion goes further upstream and further into the groundwater in other words what it'll do is that the hydrology basically the pressure of the salty water pushes back on the groundwater discharge and our groundwater becomes saline and when that happens septic systems and shallow wells become saline and then septic systems don't work so well because the biology requires bacteria that don't like salty water. Um, and of course, if your surface well is used, well, you wouldn't use it for drinking, but you might not want to use it to water your plants either. Um, and so those two effects are things that we're working on modeling right now. As far as saltwater push in surface waters, that is something that is part of a lot of work and surface work um, and especially related to shifts in, well, obviously, so drinking water intakes, so where we might be getting too close to that, although that tends to be far outside the salt wedge, but um, effects on natural resources. So fishery shifts and responses of fisheries and, and wetlands. So the wetland shift is something we've definitely looked at. Great. Um, and Karen, thank you, just posted the locality, uh, the road tool. Um, another need regarding stormwater management, water flow direction and relative values at various levels from single plot to neighborhood to locality. Is that- in, um, uh, Yeah, we, we understand that that's a very complicated piece of this puzzle, especially in highly urban areas. Um, the, the, some of our urban localities have sophisticated information about culverts and, and the hydrology, the subsurface hydrology, and some don't. Um, it's, it's harder to incorporate that information into um, models, but the model that we largely use for, for most of our hydrodynamic modeling um, at VIMS is SCISM, which is an open source 
um, non-grid, you know, a, a, an open grid hydrodynamic model that's now being used by USGS for the national water model. It's being proposed to be used for the Chesapeake Bay program for the, the estuarine model. Um, it was developed by a scientist who's actually here. And so most of our, our research, um, our tide watch flooding, all that thing is, they're all related to that model. So, so it does have the capacity to have modules added to it. Um, fairly recently, within the last year and a half, we added a tidal marsh model to look at tidal marsh shifts. So um, we do have the ability to, to work with that. If we can get the data in the first place, then we can add it into that, that um, open grade model. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, last round, um, if anybody has any more questions, put your hand up. Uh, but I think we are getting closer to close. Any final questions? Great. Um, so I am available. Um, I have put my email address in the chat um, and some of you have gotten invitations from me with my email attached. So if there are follow-ups and questions, please let us know. We will be sending out a follow-up email uh, with some of the links to the presentation. So if there was stuff that maybe we went a little bit too fast or you missed it um, and you really wanna go back and do a deep dive, um, we will be posting those materials. We will be posting links on ADAPT VA, and we will also be posting links to the VCPC website, which is inside the College of William & Mary Law School website. So those materials will be available to you. I will send out um, a response um, to everyone that attended and to our larger list of folks that um, they can go ahead and access those materials, even if you weren't able to join us today. If there are folks that we have missed that really should be invited, that we wanna make sure we keep in our community circle, please also let me know who those folks are. I would be delighted to include them. Um, so without further ado, I do want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Karen During uh, from VIMS as well, who's been our behind the scenes guru. Allie Trivet from uh, William and Mary helping us plan this event. And of course, Elizabeth. Thank you everyone for making today's event happen and we will see you soon. Thank you so much.